it happening? Okay. <laughs> All right. We are here for the first class of the book of Colossians. And um, you have a book, and it has uh, charts, it has study questions, it has outlines. Um, and it's, it's really, really good stuff. I don't know how much of this we're going to be, <laughs> be going with, except I'm going to start just on page uh, four. For those of you who don't have it on Skype, no worries. Yes. Any people anywhere on the planet? Yeah. <laughs> wow, that's, that's great. What about on Mars? Anyway, Deb said, <laughs> Deb said, uh, anybody who wants a book, you can get it. It looks like a dis studies in Colossians. I don't recognize the name down there on it, but um, all right. So we're on page four. We're just going to hit a couple of these things to to go ahead and set the stage. <coughs> And uh, all right, so Roman numeral one, church, it is, this is written to the church at Colossal, um, and it is a letter from, from Paul, and uh, it was written in Rome when he was in prison. So not many of you have had that privilege <laughs> to write epistles <laughs> it's good to have you guys here too because y'all are a lot more fun than she is oh sorry <laughs> all right uh, roman numeral two relationship with god and the a and b a is uh, we're son of god first and b church offices are next they're given to the body they are given for edification of the body. Okay, so those are all words and everything, but let's just break that down a little bit in reality. <clears throat> and that is, Paul had been struck down on the road to Damascus. God had intentionally showed up to him. We don't have a whole lot of, of that after just showing up to the apostles to let them know I'm alive. And, and he ended up writing most of the New Testament scriptures based on his letters. And um, his relationship, and you, you find this um, throughout the, the various letters that he wrote, the epistles, that, that's the word for letters, epistles. <clears throat> I always say the epistles are the wives of the apostles, but that's not true. The, the, the epistles are just letters that are <laughs> And uh, um, so he met the Lord, he saw the Lord, but he saw the Lord on the road to Damascus. But um, we find out in Galatians that after that, he was moved to seek the Lord beyond um, just the event. And a lot of times it's the event that we remember. We give our testimony and we tell an event instead of a person. You know, our emphasis is on what happened to us instead of who we just met. And, um, and he has been a Pharisee, and so the Pharisees have to know the scripture. So he decided if Jesus is real, if this is the real one, then he's, he went out into Arabia and he went to Damascus. And um, he, as he describes it, he began to seek the Lord. And there he, this is all in the first chapter of Galatians, uh, which seems I quote Galatians a lot lately. Have anybody noticed that? It seems like I'm really quoting it a lot. Um, there he came to what he terms a revelation of Christ or the actual meaning is an unveiling of Christ, which meant more to the Jews than it does to us because there was a veil between God and them in the tabernacle and in, in the temple. <clears throat> and for him to use that term, the revelation of Christ, is 
he's literally saying none of the only the high priest which Jesus was could go into the holy of holies and really meet with God and I went in through the veil okay and uh, of course he writes that to tell us that we can also now you know that's the beauty of that <clears throat> but it's not just the event of going in through a, a veil it's seeing the one who's in there. It's, it's, it's seeing the Lord that they had been doing all of this ministry for in the outer courts and in the holy place, but they'd never entered into seeing the Lord. They served the Lord. They did not see the Lord. So, um, uh, and so therefore, much of it was information that God said, but not his face. And then we find out in... Second Corinthians chapter three is Paul is again using the picture of a veil. Um, he says, when our heart turns to the Lord, the veil is rent and we see his face and we are changed into that same image. It doesn't say we are changed into Christians. And if we haven't seen his face, that's probably all we got going for us, you know, is that we're, we're saved and we're we believe in the doctrines and we believe that he came 2,000 years ago and these sort of things. But coming by real change within us is difficult except by seeing his face where we get one of the only scriptures that talk about how we're changed. We're changed into that same image from glory to glory. Okay, so I'm just going to Take a poll. How many of you would like to be changed into the image of Christ? <laughs> you know, I mean, that's the goal. More of Jesus, less of me. He must increase and I must decrease. And, and those not becoming catchphrases for new creation fellowship, but, but absolute realities for those. Any man who be in Christ, he is a new creation. That's where that comes from. So Paul, when he writes... He's right, he, he is coming from a place of, uh, well, you know, the, the scripture says an apostle, and the word apostle means one sent. And I think there's probably a, there it is. Look real quick. You got it on Skype? Okay, that's it. Uh, basically, it is just a, a, a picture depicting that um, if you are, uh, an apostle, you were sent, and we usually add with a message, but the truth is that uh, the word apostle does not necessarily imply that. We imply that from the fact that if he's sent, then he's going to tell people a message, but he is the vessel of the message. So let's think about being one sent, an apostle. <coughs> Okay, um, in truth, the, the vessel is sent to carry the person and his message. The person is Christ. So his relationship then is not with just churches and ministry. His relationship is with the one who lives within him. And that relationship dictates everything. Because the relationship is what? We're in Colossians, so we can jump ahead and throw out a scripture here. Uh, that relationship involves or, or is described by Paul as, for you are dead and your life is hid with Christ and God. When he appears and that appearing is this unveiling of him and manifesting of him, um, then we appear with him as one with him. We are that. You know that. We're one with Jesus. That took place uh, at the cross and in the resurrection. But to manifest oneness with him, see, we can look to Jesus sitting at the right hand of God and we can say, I'm one with you and you did it and I can show you all the scriptures that doctrinally spell this out. And he'd go, great, great. I you know, if Paul was doing that, he'd go, I had you there before. You know, you knew the scriptures. Now I want you to know me. But now he wants his life and his nature that he put within us, he wants that to
to be, as it were, revealed, manifested, made known to people so that he's a vessel, he, he's a vessel that's sent, but in a very real way, you could say that, that Jesus is the one being sent. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. God sent his son. God sent his son, and he's still sending his son through us now, his body. Okay, so how did he show up the first time? In his body. But he got rid of that body in that sense, and now we are his body. So where is he going to be seen? He's, he wants to be seen in his body, okay? So, I mean, if he, if he wanted everybody to believe that Jesus was God, then don't show up in us. Because <laughs> we, we are not a very good carrier of him. You appear in the sky once every uh, seven and a half months and make it bright and make it with like, forget 10,000 angels, let's go with a couple of big, okay? And for him to just yell real loud, then it will reverberate around the world, I am God, God, God. And we'd all go, Jesus is God. Okay. <clears throat> um, but for whatever reason, he wants his life in us, not just sitting up there on the throne telling us what to do, and he wants us to carry his life and not just our doctrines of his life. Amen? Amen. So I was looking at, uh, just, to, just to back this up about vessel and all that, Acts uh, chapter 9, verse 15 and 16. Acts 9, 15 and 16 says this, But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way. He's talking to Ananias. Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me. Okay, and you know, there's there's also in these scriptures uh, for uh, I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake, and so we we automatically go to the reality of persecute being persecuted for Christ. You know, that's where our minds go. He's going to show you all the stuff you're going to have to go through, but you know, just stay Christian. You know, <laughs> and he doesn't want us just to stay Christian. He wants his life formed in us. Paul said in, let's see, Galatians 4.19, I travail in birth till Christ be formed in you. Jim shared that Sunday morning. Paul is not just praying, oh, God, you know, almighty God. You know, he's praying, I'm travailing that Christ be formed in the church. This is my desire. This is my desire. Why? Because I perceive it to be your desire. And I, I even take my desire that matches yours because I love you uh, out, of the, out of the equation altogether, and I just say it's your desire and I'm with you. Can't we just, you know, well, you know, I have a great desire that everybody have Christ formed in them. Well, good, you know, but he's got a greater one. And let's bear his burden. Let's bear his name. Let's bear his heart instead of just, you know, always turning it back on us. Well, you know, <laughs> the desire was it. That's why he created all things. So that desire is in him. And, and moving him and is moving us again what's moving us his desire and if our de and if we get in line with that and our desires match with his there's no glory in that except that it was his desire in the beginning all glory to him all right so um let's see did i there's, there's, you know, 
I just have to say, there really is some good stuff in the audios that was recorded many years ago when most of y'all were like, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know the the uh, and the and they go along with the cla the things that are written in the book and the charts are all matched up and it's just a beautiful thing. Um, but uh, I want to tell you one thing, and that is that and I didn't do this on purpose. I didn't. The book of Colossians is one of the greatest, most, most fruitful areas to explain in New Testament terms the firstborn. The firstborn. So you know you're getting that on Thursday nights. Fasten your seatbelts because we're, we're going to put seatbelts on these chairs because <coughs> we're going to go. And it, and I don't know, some of you who were early on with the sharing on that, uh, you heard me say, I am not going to share the firstborn from the New Testament because you will go with whatever theology that you've been given. And I said, that's why we're going to go through the Old Testament first and then match it up and see what it's saying and so I guess the Lord decided that uh, it was time to do some matching <laughs> but it's going to be good 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 seriously it is uh, not because I'm a good teacher or we're not talking about that <laughs> we're talking about the content that the Holy Spirit's going to bring okay all right so there was also discord in the Colossian church in fact every church he wrote to there was discord <clears throat> and it, but it was of different nature each one had something else going on and there was this thing and and um, some were staying with Christianity but they were leaving the faith <clears throat> okay what do I mean by the faith that's the question see we're not talking about the faith of just being a Christian we're talking about the faith of the Son of God. We're talking about that which Paul described in Galatians 2.20 when he said, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, Christ liveth in me, and the life I now live in the flesh I live by the faith of the Son of God who loves by giving himself, who loved me and gave himself for me. And therefore I am going to love him and give myself that he might live in me I am crucified he lives and that that being <coughs> uh, the avenue all right so I want to I want to do some comparing now um, Colossians with Ephesians and um, and it's a really good comparison and when as I go through these comparisons it's going to sound like why are we studying Colossians, man? Ephesians sounds really cool. <laughs> That's, I'm seriously, it, it, it's going to sound like that. But <clears throat> every one of the things that, that Paul is saying in Colossians that doesn't sound quite as good and dynamic as Ephesians, he wrote both of them. He wrote them plus the same time because the wording is almost the same in some of these things as far as parts of it. <clears throat> what we're going to find is that Paul is saying something, but he's saying it from a different angle, and hopefully we'll get to that by the end of this, this class right here. Okay, so we're going to look at, well, before we do that, <clears throat> remember I was talking about the discord. Uh, verse 1 said, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timotheus, our brother, and then, um, did I even not put it in yeah to the saints and faithful brethren so he's not just writing to the saints he's writing to the faithful brethren can you do you get that he's going look i know you're going to get this you know um so uh, well before i go to the next part 
there is that thing that he says, I, I'm, I'm writing this to you, to the saints and to the faithful brethren that are at Colossal. Grace be unto you in peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He's saying, I'm a vessel with a message. Okay, we go, oh, he's an apostle. He's, an, he's a vessel with a message. He's an apostle or whatever. Uh, he's saying, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a carrier boy. I'm, the, I'm, not the, I'm the messenger boy. This is from God our Father. And from the Lord Jesus Christ, this is not me. <laughs> this isn't coming from me, except for as a carrier, as a vessel sent. But I bring this from someone else. And he says, from God, our Father. God, our Father. Immediately, He's dealing with son, sons right there, and he's dealing with the son being in us. And he's identifying that as this is what's going on. Your father wants to talk to you. Praise God, huh? Praise God. And from our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. Um, So now, uh, verse 3. And remember, we're going to compare Colossians 3.6 with Ephesians 3.5. <laughs> okay, see how the parallel is pretty close? Colossians 3-6 to six with Ephesians 3-5. to five. Okay, Colossians first. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which you have uh, to all the saints, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of truth of the gospel, which is come unto you, as it is in all the world, bringing forth fruit, as it does also in you since the day ye heard of it and knew the grace of God. All right, so... He's talking about a hope. He's talking about uh, what's laid up in heaven, the hope relating to um, what's, as it were, laid up in heaven, as, uh, which has come unto you as it is in all the world. He's talking about the world. Um, and since the day you heard of it, he's talking about days he's, and times and all this kind of stuff. Okay, now listen to the Ephesian version, because I'm not explaining this yet. We have to go through it. But listen to the Ephesian version, 3 through 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who have, you see that? It starts off almost the same. Who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him, not in the world, come to all the world, but before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us to the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to his good pleasure, the good pleasure of his will. You see how that sounds so much better? How the emphasis is out of the earth. It's not talking about a hope in heaven. It's not talking about it. It's, it is completely saturated in the reality of God's heart. So, um, <laughs> okay, I don't know if I want to say that. All right, Colossians, um, let me see, did I? Let's do Colossians 7 through 9. As you also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ. This is Colossians. We're talking about Epaphras, fellow servant, faithful minister. Who also declared unto us your love in the spirit. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire you might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. <clears throat> all right, now let's... Read Ephesians 1, 15 through 20. <clears throat> Notice some of the same wording. 
Wherefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, right? Sounds that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation unveiling in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places and it goes on far above all principalities and powers and, and dominions and every name that is named whether in heaven and earth we've just been taken to the four corners of the heart of God okay As you also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, which is for you a faithful minister, who, uh, let's see, for this cause, since they, so, so he's, he's praying, but it's, it's vague, but it's not vague, and nothing in Colossians is vague. It's just not known yet, okay? He's going on a completely different track. He wrote to the Ephesians because this is what they needed. And this was where they were at. And he's writing to the Colossians because this is what they need. And this is where they're at. And he's given them both Christ, but he's given it according to the measure that the Spirit of God is doling out to each, each group. Because the Spirit of God's been leading them when Paul wasn't anywhere near them. Amen? Amen? Praise God. All right. So, um, all right. So, in one sense, it sounds like Paul is just kind of talking with him. Um, but he's actually talking, that first part when he talks about in the earth, throughout the whole earth, and, and, and that sort of thing. He's talking about the results of something that he's going to bring up that affects the heaven and the earth. Okay. He's going to go there. Um, Ephesians is talking about the heart of God in the vast extremes of, of the eternal things that God did through Christ. Uh, but but uh, Colossians is going to bring out, well, I, I, I labeled it practicalities of Christ in you. Practicalities of Christ in you. Okay. Well, that's a sweet little title. How about practicalities of the firstborn in you? How about Colossians 1.27? Christ in you, the hope of glory, having a whole new understanding and realm when he says, firstborn in you, the hope of glory. Guess what? That's what he's saying, and the scriptures will prove it, leading up to it, not after it, leading up to it. He goes into that as all of this reality of the firstborn starts filtering down because he's talking about life in the flesh, life in the earth, life in not near as much fun as I'm in Christ and I have all spiritual blessings in heavenly places and all this, you know, and it's, it's great. It's wonderful. But in Colossians, he's trying to bring it all down here. And he wants Christ to be manifested in our mortal flesh. That's what Paul said. He said, you know, that I want Christ manifest in my mortal flesh, whether by life or death. That's... That's it. That's, you know, okay, well, I want to, you know, if God's going to really use me, let it be a manifestation of Christ in my mortal body. If God's going to have the people rise up against me and cut my head off, which is what happened to him in Rome, let Christ be magnified in that. You say, well, how can Christ be magnified in that? You know, that's a failure. <laughs> no, that was a self-giving. 
was a sacrifice. It was, it was by the life of Christ that was in him to be manifested through him that that was done so that it was still just like Jesus on the cross or, or every offering that came before that represented a sweet savor to God. It was a, it was a yielding to that nature and instead of fighting, laying down your life. Instead of being murdered, being given to the glory of the Father. And to say, Father, life comes out of death. Let it, let it bring forth of your Son in greater measure than it would have had I been preaching even further than I have been. All right. Now verse uh, 10 through 12 then, Colossians <clears throat> chapter 1. That you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all. Okay, so I love this. All right, verse 11. Here we go. Oh, Lord, hear my prayer. Strengthen me with all might according to your glorious power. And then it goes on to say, unto, this is strengthening is unto something, unto all patience and long suffering and joyfulness and giving thanks unto the Father. We go, strengthen me to be a great minister. Strengthen me to do great things. He would just be happy if you could just be patient for a change. <laughs> I mean, he's not asking a lot here. He's not going, you know, you know, I'm, I'm asking the impossible. He's saying, this is the, the fruit unto all fruitfulness. This is the fruit of the life of Christ within us. It's the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, gentleness, meekness, faith, temperance, long-suffering, as I usually say. Long-suffering. Can you, because he could have just said suffering. <laughs> he's, trying to, he's trying to say, okay, you can hold your breath for a while, but I'm going to have to give you long suffering. <laughs> Find out what's really in you, you know. So I, I find it extremely interesting that, you know, preachers that are preaching the power of God and all this stuff and the, the, all about the strength and everything, that they very seldom mention, let's be strengthened unto all patience and all long suffering. And, you know, with that spirit, okay, well, as we're going to find out in the first chapter, very quickly, we're already getting right on the verge of the scriptures of of the firstborn and why he's the firstborn and what the firstborn is about and the heart of the father. He's already laying the groundwork for what all this is going to mean. It's all reality being uh, filling you, filling you with all spiritual wisdom, filling you with his understanding so that you can be prepared to allow the firstborn to give himself. So that you can allow that. And you'll need to be strengthened with all might to be weak. <laughs> I mean, look at Jesus. You know, I one of the pictures that always strict, sticks in my mind the strongest and and um, uh, I saw the movie Gladiator I was down in Costa Rica and Jeff and Doug wanted to come not our Jeff but Jeff Cheryl wanted to go to a movie we've been ministering all week long and they said let's go to a movie I said I'm tired I don't want to go to I said I promise I'll fall asleep I'm so tired and they went no man it's really It'll be great. And so they found out that the movie they wanted to see wasn't showing. So we went, so of course we drove from there, and this is in San Jose, and we drive to uh, a, a place where we rent a VHS. 
and take it back to the judge's place and put it in there and start the thing. And it's, it's like the worst stolen copy, you know what I mean, where somebody's sitting there with some camera recording it. It's horrible. And people walking in front, people sitting there talking. I mean, it's horrible. And the, and the coloration was like brown and white, you know what I mean? It was, just, it was the worst, you know? And, and of course, halfway through, Doug and Jeff were asleep. Okay, but that, that's not the point that I wanted to make, and that was <clears throat> at the very beginning of that, that movie, there's the Romans on one side, and man, they're, they're trained, and they're, you know, they're, they've got all of this weaponry and all of this armor and all this, and on the other side over there are these barbarians, and I mean, they look like Oak Cliff, you know, they look like they're just, I mean, they got, you know, the, the mohawk and the, you know, and they're going, ah! And the Romans are just standing there waiting, you know, and it's like, you know, ah! So they both come down and it's, you know, epic battle and everything. And, and later the Lord was talking to me about it and he said, well, here's the true battle with Jesus. He said, over here was all these barbarians, us, and all of mankind and all of this stuff. Ah! And on the other side is a little lamb. Go and the barbarians are coming and the little lambs coming out. You know, you look from a distance, you see this little white figure kind of going. <laughs> he's going, ah! Jesus wasn't thinking. As a little lamb, I'm going to just wipe out these guys. He's thinking one thing: I'm here to die. I'm here to give my life. Yet, in so doing, I can defeat every beast if you want, you want me, yeah. If you, but you'll have to look to a slaughtered lamb. You'll have to look to a man bleeding, dead, and uh, told, everybody was told that he was um, a, a deceiver and a heretic and a, uh, all these kind of things and demons. He had demon. All these things that were said about him, open not his mouth. He's a lamb because he's not going to defeat with human power. He's going to defeat with God power. Lamb power is the better word. And through death he destroyed him that had the power of death. That is the devil. For the no, you not for the old man was crucified with him. And on and on and on and on and on. Uh, uh, I am crucified unto the world. How do you do? You know, well, the world. I am crucified unto the world and the world unto me. You just keep going. Um, uh, Romans 6, what is it, 7 or long about there. Reckon yourselves also to be dead like he did. But we're preaching strength and power and just, you know, c come down to the altar and commit yourself and just get your, you know, your dedication going, you know what I mean? And, I, you know, and some of you remember that I, I, when I was in Bible school, I was down the altar every time, so much so, and nothing was happening because I was trying to get more dedicated until my dedicator wore out and broke. I just got to have any more left. I was in the perfect place. Lord, I can't do it. I'm sorry. I failed you. He's going, <laughs> you don't even know, dude. <laughs> I'm sure he said that, dude, though. <clears throat> you know, because then you become empty that he can, be, he can fill you. Then what you cannot do, he can do and will do. But we're... We, we're still too full, you know, we're too strong, we're, we're too, too wise, we're too together. Uh, we're afraid of weakness because we don't want to look weak, you know. But we are weak. And the Lord, if he really thinks that you're halfway serious, he will, don't worry, he'll bring you to a place where you'll have to face your own weaknesses. 
so that you can find him as your strength. Okay. Anyway, um, verse 10 again, Colossians 1, 10, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, that you may walk worthy of the Lord. The Lord? Who's the Lord? Who's the Lord on the throne that everybody's worshiping in the book of Revelation? It's the Lamb of God. And it says a slaughtered lamb. You know? Walk worthy? How about walk worthy by limping? Anybody remember Jacob? Yeah. Jacob was smart and he was good and manipulative and he can figure stuff out and he was always working the system and he's always doing all this kind of stuff and he's so good at it and he's going through life you know he's ripping off Esau I did it twice and you know he's real happy with that and everything and uh, but then Esau got mad at the last one and said I'm going to kill him because Esau was a hunter and Jacob was like a mama's boy that was a manipulator. Don't worry, mama, I'll just manipulate him. So he, he ran. Mom said, get out of here. Because <laughs> I'm telling you, Brother Esau will <laughs> cut you into little pieces. Um, so he, he ran, and then he got to Laban, his mom's brother, and they're... He's manipulating everything there. <clears throat> so I got a little manipulation back from Laban on the woman he's going to marry. And he goes through all this stuff, and he's manipulating. And then finally, God says it's time to go back. So he's going back, and he's going back with his wife, and he's going back with all of his stuff and all this kind of stuff. And, and somebody comes and says, Esau is coming. <clears throat> Esau is coming with a bunch of his men. And he's going, oh, Lord. You know, because he... <laughs> because he's still a manipulator. You know, I'll throw words at you. So that night he wrestles with God. He wrestles with God, and when he comes away, he comes away limping, and God gives him a new name. Now you're prince with God. You're no longer Jacob, manipulator. You are Israel, prince with God. As he limps away, weak and unable to, to do all the stuff that he did before. And the whole nation got called after his name. That was God's heart. But I'm jumping the gun on um, Thursday night class. <laughs> Big time. But there's way more, way, way more, trust me. Don't think that I just gave away all that. I did not even close. There is such good stuff there, but I'm not going to. Uh, I just had to set the stage because the, the reality is when this is talking about, this is all talking about the firstborn and it's going to blow your mind as it breaks forth. But right now he's just setting the stage and he's saying that you walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing and that means walk with a limp. <laughs> that means the limp is the sacrificed one limping in you unto all pleasing unto all please don't 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 go do a few things and think you're pleasing god let's do all pleasing by the lord that we walk worthy un, unto being fruitful in every good work increasing in the knowledge of god okay so <clears throat> we want to do all pleasing and we want to be fruitful in every good work, but the truth is you're not going to do that unless you're increasing in the knowledge of God. You've got to, see, this, he didn't say increasing in omniscience. Because if you want to talk about the knowledge of God, he's omniscient. So I have, to, I have to learn everything. I have to learn, you know, why a tadpole, you know, <laughs> sniffs a rock before he's, you know, <laughs> you know, they probably don't, but, <laughs> but you know, that's omniscient, all knowledge. So we're, we're trying to increase in the knowledge of God. No, 
He's not talking about increasing in omniscience. He's saying know the Lord. Know him. Know what he's like. Learn him. Learn his nature. Learn his. See, we have a we have a personality, and our personality tends to be us. God's God's nature is who He is. He, it's it's not about His personality. He's He's not surface. You know. So He's He's telling us you need to know God. And then all pleasing and all these things, all fruitfulness can start coming about. Strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. And I, so I see, uh, this is just me, I see all might. Here's where I see all might. I see the Son of God, God himself being hung on a cross by the very people he made, even the wood that he made, created originally, and hanging on a cross, and in the garden even saying, I, I could call 10,000 angels and just <laughs> grease spot. That's all you'd be, you know. It'd be, it'd be real easy for me, you know. I can do that. But that's not who I am, and that's not why I'm here. I didn't come to destroy life, but to give it. But to give it, he has to destroy the old man, the old nature, the old way, the old mind, the old, all of, all of those things. So, so he's declaring in words that we may not have caught unless we understood what he was about to talk about, starting in verse 14, about the firstborn. Giving thanks unto the Father. Giving thanks unto the Father. Where does that come from? Just give thanks to God. Well, thank, thank God. There. I'm, see how spiritual I am? Well, thank God for that. And he's up there going, whoo, whoo, heaven just moved. Because he went, thank God. You know, I mean, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us fit to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. All right, well, how are we going to get all that down unless we know who he's talking about? Who he's talking about? not just what he's talking about. Um, how are we going to know the Bible? And Jesus said, Behold, in the volume of the book it's written of me. Search the scriptures, for they are they which testify me. Every time he talks about it, he's talking about whether it's, he doesn't say, there's the vast knowledge of God there. You'll learn about zebras and all kind of stuff, you know. No, he's not, you know, he always says this is this pertains to me. Okay. So search the scriptures to know me. And to if you know me, you'll know the we say, if you know him, you'll know life, right? Okay. We see we banter these phrases, these scriptural phrases around. Well, if you know him, you'll have life. But he is the life. And we'll never know what life to live or even have a, a measuring rod. You know, we go, I'm a good Christian. I, I go to church, I tithe, I read my Bible, or I have devotions. I, you know, you know all, that, all those, I have devotions. I have devotions. Okay, I'm not, I'm not trying to be critical of anybody or anything. I'm just saying we need to be searching the scriptures to know him, not have devotions. Well, well, this Bible story, this tells me that we need to be more kind to animals. <laughs> or, you know, I mean, I've heard people say stuff like that. They read, you know, well, well, when the donkey was talking, you should have been more kind to him. He is telling you that you're the jack. Never mind. <clears throat> <laughs> okay.
Oh, okay, good. I, I think I, I might be able to wrap this up here pretty quick. Um, verse uh, 13, we just read 10 uh, through 12. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. And most of you know that the actual translation is the kingdom of the son of his love. Okay. He could have said, I saved you. I did. I, I defeated the devil. I, you know, I did all this and I did it so that your life would be great on the earth. I defeated the devil so that your life, you wouldn't have to mess with the devil. He goes, Paul just sees it and he goes, look, he delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of the son of his love. He didn't just save you from the devil so you could be a, have a happy life on the earth. <laughs> you know? Deliver, translate. Well, let me, you don't have to turn there. I'm going to read uh, Matthew 6, 9 through 13. It's just the Lord's Prayer. You know it. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, Our Father, which art in heaven, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be thy name. What's his name? Father. That's a son. That's a son. And I honor you. Well, you're the firstborn. You have everything. You are given everything of your father. You are everything to me, Father. I'm not trying to become that. I want to be what you want me to be. Well, that's why I raised you and exalted you and set me at my own right, set you at my own right hand over all principalities and powers and dominions and might and all that. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. I mean, you know, he's not saying make me a better Christian. Make me a more powerful Christian. Make me a more known Christian. He said forgive your debtors. <laughs> I mean, I mean I'm, what I'm trying to do is put this in the context of what most of us know as normal Christianity, that we would, why, you know, the way we pray is, you know, give me this and give me, you know. It used to be, give me a Cadillac. Now it's give me a BMW. But anyway, it's, you know, <laughs> we're, it's always about, well, you know, and if I'm good, you'll take care of everything and you'll make everything, you know, run and, you know, I won't have any problems and stuff like that. How about... Give me to feed on the bread of life daily. Give me the ability to forgive. You know, I remember I wrote it down once. I was writing down about forgiveness. And I wrote, forgive everyone. <laughs> forgive everyone. Just forgive everyone. Just go. Find everyone and forgive them. <laughs> you know what I mean? Just go forgive them. Well, I can't. Because I got a splinter from the cross when they made me carry it. <laughs> you know? And it hurt for days. It got infected. And then that shouldn't have happened to me. Can you hear Simon of Serene? blessed to be able to carry the cross of Christ for a while. And he's complaining and goes home, you will not believe what happened to me. It's all about the Romans and what they did to him instead of taking up that cross just for a little longer for Jesus' sake, doing, doing it for him instead of him always doing it for us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. He hath delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Uh, deliver us. He hath delivered us. Deliver us from the evil one. When it says deliver us from evil, it is actually deliver us from the evil one. Check it out. 
deliver us. He hath delivered us. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Don't talk anymore. That's what it, you know, it's, that's an amen. Let's live in that, you know. Well, I'm, I have a hard time living, you know, believing in the Lamb in this way and everything. For God's sake, for eight years you believed in Santa Claus. You can believe in the Lamb for a little while. I mean, Lord, forgive me, but I mean, come on. Just, never mind, never mind. I'm sorry for that, but I just, Lord. Well, the clock and that last statement says that's enough. <laughs> All right. Kelly's going to be up next. We'll take a little break. If you're on Skype, we're going to come back very shortly, and Kelly will be sharing on Micah still. Okay. Father, we just love you so much, and we want the life of your son, and we don't want to understand anything except we want to know. We want to know him, and we want you to, to break through our, um, our great understandings and make it all life. And make it all you, Jesus, and fill us up, fill us up, fill us up. The fullness that is you, we ask in your name.